Hey guys, welcome back to the show. I'm excited to share this week's episode with you. Um, this week I had an amazing conversation with a guy who um, has been in the, around the industry for 10 or 15 years um, and just a really unique guy, extremely knowledgeable about uh, rifles and ballistics and different cartridges as well as really everything backcountry. He's the host of an awesome podcast that I recommend you check out called the Backcountry Hunting Podcast. Uh, so if you don't know already, uh, my guest this week is Joseph Von Benedict. And again, just a class act, a uh, very knowledgeable guy, um, really cool, uh, just interesting voice um, and um, and just a wealth of knowledge. So I was really excited, um, like I said to, to Joseph after we finished the podcast, I mean, some conversations um, drag on and are a little, you know, more difficult to have than others. Um, but this conversation just flew by for me and actually there was, there was stuff I wanted to hit, but, but didn't get to. So maybe in the future, Joseph will be kind enough to come back on the show and, and answer some more of my questions. But this one's chock full of really good advice. Um, you know, a lot of it is, um, you know, he's kind of an expert in terms of, like I said, cartridges and rifles and stuff like that. And, and so I really wanted to talk to him about, um, you know, I have a great backcountry gun for deer sized game. I have a Weatherby backcountry in 6.5 Creedmoor. It's lightweight. I like that cartridge a lot, like I said, for deer sized game. And I know a lot of guys will say it's plenty for elk. Me personally, and Joseph agrees, um, I want something with a little more punch if I got a shot at an elk. So, you know, I'm thinking about putting together a, another backcountry rifle this year. Um, and I and I really wanted to dive in with Joseph on what he recommends for elk size game, even up to moose and stuff like that, and a backcountry hunting gun. So so we go through that, um, and you know we hit on the spiritual side of stuff and a couple other things. So it's a really really interesting conversation, especially if you might be in the market for a backcountry rifle. And so, uh, anyway, I hope you guys enjoy it. Um, I do want to do a couple quick shout outs for some people who left me, uh, written reviews on Apple podcasts. Um, and guys, if you, if you like the show, if you like the content, I know I hit on a hit on it a lot, but it'd be super helpful if you just take five minutes to write me a written review, um, or even just give me a rating. That's better than nothing. But those written reviews really go a long way in helping me get the, the message out with other folks. And um, like I said, I'm going full on this year, but I need you all's support. So if you haven't done so yet, if you're new, please go ahead and do that. And if you leave me a written review, I'll sh give you a shout out on the show and uh, send you some swag. So if you are listening, Lydia from Wisconsin... I might have already mentioned her, not sure, but either way, uh, Chuck in Boise, um, WV Outdoorsman, or Fenis Delos, or Fenis Delos, not sure how you say your name, but thank you guys for leaving me reviews. Uh, hit me up on Instagram, at the Hunter's Quest, and I'll send you some swag in the mail. Um, uh, for everyone out there, you know, go ahead and follow me on Instagram, at the Hunter's Quest, or my personal account, at Hunter McWaters, and please follow on the YouTube channel, which you can find by searching my name, Hunter McWaters. Um, lastly, I want to share a verse with you guys this week because Joseph tells a story at the end of the podcast, pretty amazing story about how God was watching out for him on a solo backcountry hunt in Alaska and kind of um, helped him out. So uh, stick around for that interesting story. And the verse I want to give you um, that kind of goes along with that is uh, John 15, 7. And this is Jesus talking, and he says, If you abide in me, and my words abide in you, ask whatever you wish, and it will be done for you. Pretty powerful stuff there. Um, I believe it. I believe it's true. I believe uh, in the power of prayer. And uh, so, if you abide in him, and his words abide in you, Ask whatever you wish, and it will be done for you. And Joseph has a story that kind of goes along with that. So I hope you guys will stick around to the end of the episode and hear that cool story. Um, but anyway, thanks again for your support. Stick around for all the cool stuff we got coming down the line, and enjoy this week's episode. I'll, uh, I'll see you guys in the next episode, and uh, thanks again. I'm here today with my guest. Excited to talk to Mr. Joseph Von Benedict. How you doing, man? 
I'm good, Hunter. It's an honor to be on your podcast here with you. Yeah, it's great to have you, man. Um, so yeah, a little while ago, well, I've, you know, if you guys haven't heard, um, Joseph is the host of the Backcountry Hunting Podcast, an awesome show, just full of a lot of great info. Um, so definitely check him out there. But um, and as you'll you. hear, oh yeah, you're welcome, man. As you're here going forward, um, he has probably one of the most epic podcasting voices ever <laughs> oh i don't know about that but <laughs> well, thanks i'm not gonna lie are, you, up on are you saying i have a face for radio <laughs> <laughs> no but like i um i heard you a couple times on some different podcasts when i was first getting going and then i looked you up on instagram and i was like I, you look totally different than how i was expecting you with your voice i thought you'd be like some like 55 year old grizzled like old like not saying you sound old but you just sound like so um i don't know like distinguished or something i was not expecting you to be like a younger guy <laughs> <laughs> well thanks i think <laughs> no i mean you, you sound wiser than your years that's that's what i meant to say oh well i um, <laughs> i'm not sure i deserve that but i'll take it <laughs> well anyway thanks for joining me today man uh we were just talking so you're you're coming out of idaho is that correct yeah southeastern idaho okay how's the weather out there it's been cold. You know, we, we've we been in that same drought that's kind of um, plaguing a lot of the, all this uh, western and, and especially southwestern part of the country. And mm. man, we thought it had broke. In December, we got dumped on with a bunch of consecutive storms. We had probably two and a half feet of snow, and then it just wow. quit on us. It's just been mm. cold. It's been bright, you know, beautiful days, but ah, I'm always torn. I look out there and I think, hey, this is awesome for the mule deer. They'll have another mild winter, high fawn survival rates, you know, good health coming into the summer. And then the farmer and rancher in me is just lamenting like, <laughs> oh man, clearly not enough moisture for the coming yeah. year. So I'm keeping my fingers crossed and throwing a prayer heavenward now and then that we get a few more good snowstorms before uh, old man winter decides to call it quits. Yeah. Well, I'm glad to hear that because in in one respect, I'm glad to hear that because uh, I have uh, a deer tag in Idaho this year. So that's good to hear. Also going to have a concurrent running uh, rifle elk season. And I was blessed to have the cash to be able to grab both tags um, nice. just because I knew if I went in there with a deer tag only, I would definitely see elk. Now that I have a tag, I probably won't see any, but you know, at least Naturally, I have it. That's, that's how it goes, right? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it's awesome to hunt though with multiple tags in your pocket. Pick up a bear tag. I don't think those are limited for okay. non-residents. Are you, where, where do you live? Where are you out of? I am in another world, man. I'm in Virginia. Ah, cool. Far yeah. into the country. I'm yeah, like, see if you can pick up a bear tag and a wolf tag. You never know. You might. I get did a, get a wolf tag. Um, nice. I did not think about grabbing a bear tag as well, but uh, might not be a bad idea for sure. Yeah. Have you hunted that that area before? Uh, you know, I've hunted near there, and it's uh, it's pretty cool. Uh, it's big, gnarly, rugged country. So yeah, uh, at least where I was, I'm not sure what it'll be like where you're at, but uh, it's awesome to hunt with three or four different tags in your pocket. Mm -hmm. Just a, a great thing because you got so many options and you can shift gears at a moment's notice and yeah, go after something you weren't expecting. And Idaho, by the way, uh, I'll have to confirm with this year's regs, but I'm pretty sure it hasn't changed. You can use a deer tag on a bear. And oh, in fact, I've got a, a friend of a friend last fall shot a, um, like a 400 pound color phase black bear and wow. put his deer tag on it. So it happens, but I'll have to you check know, the regs. yeah, may as well yeah. have both anyway. Right. That ought to be just tremendous. Yeah. It's gonna be an adventure, man, for sure. So, but, um, anyway, man, um, I, like I said, you are the host of the Backcountry Hunting Podcast. I think a lot of my listeners have probably heard it. If you haven't, definitely check it out. But I'd love to just hear real quick um, for those people who maybe aren't as familiar with you, just kind of, uh, you know, a little bit of your backstory, um, you know, in a nutshell and kind of how you got into what you're doing now and what you're up to these days. Yeah, sure. Um, well, I grew up in southern Utah, way out in the middle of nowhere, town of Boulder. And at the time, it, there were 90 residents 
mostly wow. old <laughs> ranchers, you know, historic stock that their grand, great-grandparents had settled there. And we were 100 miles from a stoplight or a supermarket. Wow. Yeah, pretty that remote. So there. I grew up uh, fishing a lot and then hunting, you know, when I was of age to do so and just loved it. I got started competitive shooting when I was 14 and uh, mostly black powder stuff, but hmm. that broadened out into uh, everything from three gun to F class. And I do some PRS shooting now. I really enjoy cool. that. It's a great way to polish your... Um, your riflemanship skills For sure. on dynamic targets and improvised positions and extended ranges and so forth. Anyway, went to uh, the university, a couple of different universities here in Idaho and in Utah and um, studied creative writing. I thought I wanted to be a novelist. Sometimes I still think I do, but <laughs> <laughs> I haven't broken into that yet. I've had one or two couple you know, pieces of short fiction published way back when, but started mm-hmm. publishing hunting stories in college just for fun. Yeah. And now one thing led to another. I got hired in 2007, coming up on 15 years ago, by the, uh, the Peterson Publishing outfit out in Los Angeles. Cool. And had to move there. And I'd always sworn there was two places in this world I'd never lived, and that was L.A. or New York. Yeah, <laughs> going from a 90-person town to L.A. Well, not yeah, directly, no, I'd, but... I'd done a lot of traveling by then, right. you know, so I'd been around enough to know what I was getting into, thankfully. But funny <laughs> enough, you know, I was, I'd been married for a couple of years, and my wife and I loved it. We were there for two years. We were poor as church mice, but... We could drive to the beach. We could walk a lot of places from our little apartment. It was a 1934 apartment in downtown western L.A. where cool. there's a lot of movie stars, you know, got their start in yeah. those little apartments and stuff. So it's kind of cool. That was cool. Then spent four years in Illinois heading up Shooting Times Magazine as editor-in-chief and had a couple of kids, three kids by then, and just didn't want to raise my kids out there. Mm. I wanted to be in the Rocky Mountains where I grew up, where we could hunt public land and a little different political climate and family <laughs> was around. So we moved back to Utah and I've been writing full time now and and uh, podcasting full time now for three years, writing full time for 10 years. And cool. It's a good life. Yeah. Yeah, man. Um, well, that's really cool. So how was your hunting season this year? Yeah, 2021 was pretty good. It was different. Uh, you know, as a profession, I end up hunting a lot, often internationally. Hmm. 2020 was rough. There, we, I mean, everything was shut yeah. down because of the virus panic. Right. And 2021 was pretty fun. I had a, a shocking last minute opportunity to hunt uh, Rocky Mountain bighorn sheep, which was something I dreamed all my life of. Had two and a half weeks to get ready for that. How does that happen? (laughs) Well, it's a a long story, but I'll give you the brief version. It was a conservation tag on tribal land in New Mexico. And through a connection uh, at Federal Ammunition, I was able to uh, to do that hunt. But it's kind of funny when I got the message. It was, "Hey, bighorn sheep hunt, but it's in two and a half weeks." Is you know, do you want to do this? Could you even do this? And yeah. my response was, "I can leave in an hour and be there in the morning if you need me to." <laughs> <laughs> you don't say no to that one, right? So I did that. It was a, an incredibly rich experience as far as the you know the the whole package, but it was so abbreviated two and a half Mm. weeks to get ready. When usually you plan for something like that for months, you know, and then, uh, one day of hunting, we climbed to almost 13,000 feet. We found a tremendous old ram. He ended up being 14 years old and uh, it was a conservation tag. So we were hunting for a management sheep, a very old ram, um, but a, a big, beautiful sheep and, uh, just a wonderful sp- experience all around, just abbreviated, you know, the whole time yeah. I, I had to keep telling myself to, to hit save in my brain and remember <laughs> the scenes around me and what I was feeling and, you know, looking at the sheep because it happened so fast Yeah. And then I was home, you know, and then I, I had my four little, uh, full-time hunting clients you know i've got four kids plus my wife and had a ton of fun hunting with them here in idaho all of them that were legal got mule deer 
Nice. And their best mule deer to date. I did not get one because I was too busy guiding and packing theirs. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, had an archery tag in a decent unit here in, in Idaho and, and did not close the deal. I saw a few nice bulls, but a real pressured area. And right. I got there late in the season and just couldn't, couldn't bring it to pass. Mm. Um, ended up in the Czech Republic for several days, shot a mouflon Whoa. over there, okay. free range mouflon. That was pretty cool. That was and, cool. Uh, then the the last big hurrah of the season was I spent a week on Kodiak Island with several friends in nice. well right after Thanksgiving going over into December, that was just epic. We had we we're on a boat, um, a transporter boat, so it's a DIY hunt. But at yeah. nights you sleep on a boat, you're warm, you're well fed. It's a great way to hunt Sitka blacktails on Kodiak Island. And our group of seven guys shot fourteen mature bucks. Nice. We had the the longest stretch of sustained uh, cold weather on Kodiak Island in the last thirty to fifty years. Wow! So there was ice all over everything. We had winds. Well, one night they topped hundred miles an hour on the boat. Oh my gosh! That's it was insane. pretty gnarly. I was sitting in the cabin at about five in the morning, sipping on a hot chocolate, <laughs> talking to the captain, and I said how fast was that wind? And he said, oh, it was 85 knots or more. And I, I just looked at him. I didn't know what knots were, you know. Right. I'm a landlubber. And he said, that's more than 100 miles an hour. And then he kind of chuckled. And he said, yeah, in Florida, they'd norm this, name this storm. <laughs> Up here, it's just another crappy day on Kodiak. <laughs> wow, man. That's intense. Yeah, that's hurricane force for sure. Yeah. Well, um, we shot we shot a bunch of nice deer, half a dozen of those foxes, the, the black... Mm-hmm cross uh, you know silver and red cross foxes and shot some ducks caught some fish i caught a big uh, uh i was getting mixed up yellow eye okay uh fish yeah very cool experience you did a full-on cast and blast that's that's cool we did yes i actually i went to kodiak this year too um it was my first time up there but we went in august so um a little different experience you know we flew in to a lake up in the alpine and um and did it that way and just had a base camp and spent like six days back there but it's an amazing place man yes it is it's really cool so uh, what about uh this next year you got anything uh, in the works you're looking forward to that you can talk about yet oh a few i mean always the hunts around home here in yeah. idaho uh, we can still buy over-the-counter tags here which is one of the big reasons i left utah i was becoming a real challenge to get good tags yeah. there and with little kids that all want to hunt right uh you know i i wanted them to grow up having similar opportunities to what i had For and sure. uh so you know i'll be busy with that again i am hoping to get back to hunt with my uh i've got a good friend jock strauss he uh operates kovas uh, hunting safaris in namibia Ooh. hoping to go hunt with him and with crusader safaris it's a free range operation in uh on the eastern cape of south africa kind of do a a two-pronged trip over there cool this spring uh bear hunting round home of course and then you know whatever this fall brings uh, i do have one really potentially great hunt this fall schedule i'm going back to to do a drop camp diy moose hunt in alaska nice. Yeah, same area I shot a, a really tremendous bull in 2017 on a DIY hunt there. and Looking forward to that. They're always awesome. grueling, but just really, really cool. Yeah, man. That's that's on my list of stuff to do in the future for sure. Um, so that kind of brings me to what I wanted to hit with you next, um, because one of the things that's really cool about your podcast um, that I've gotten a lot from is um, you're very knowledgeable about rifles and cartridges and ballistics and that kind of stuff and um see where i grew up hunting the county i grew up hunting in was archery and shotgun only so i I really dove into the bow hunting so like like, condolences (laughs) yeah (laughs) i was the same way in illinois for four years so really i know where you're coming from yeah yeah and uh so really like I didn't really start getting into rifles until like two or three years ago. So, and, and I didn't know, you know, I, you, you don't know what you don't know. So like, I had no idea what a, I mean, it's its whole own world of, you know, you know, 
Like, I just literally thought, I was like, oh, yeah, you just, you know, grab a rifle and throw a scope on there and just kind of go for it. You know, I had no idea about rifles. Um, so it's been fun for me getting into that lately um, just because it was something I didn't know much about. Um, so I, I do, I did this last year um, invest in a pretty nice, um, you know, backcountry rifle. It is um, 6.5 six, Creedmoor. Or six five need more, as sometimes I've heard you say on your show. <laughs> Creed more wasting disease. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so, it's a great it's, cartridge. It has limitations, uh, yeah. which some folks don't For recognize, sure. but within its realm, it is spectacular. For sure, and I, uh, it's a Weatherby backcountry. Oh, um, nice. Yeah, I I was looking at different rifles. I was looking at Tika and and some. I almost went with the Tika, and I was like, but in the back of my head, I just always wanted a Weatherby and I was like if I don't buy it I'm just gonna buy one later down the road anyway so I might as well just get what I want the first time buy once cry once there you go so um anyway it's it's great rifle I took um and we we me and my buddy developed a load for it it's um I think 40.2 grains of Varget and uh, 124 grain Hunter Hammer yeah Hammer Hunter it's a copper monolithic bullet Sure. And it's dude, it's performed very well. I've, I've killed so I killed a whitetail with it two years ago with ELDX Hornady, and it did leave an extremely minimal blood trail. The deer died cleanly after about sixty yards, but still it was a little hard to follow. But this year, switching to that copper mono, I shot a like a nice seventy inch uh, pronghorn buck with it. I shot that Sitka black tail, and I shot another white tail. Um, the blacktail and the pronghorn dropped in their tracks. I mean, like dead before hit the ground. Um, mm. The whitetail nice. was quartering too hard and ran 10 yards and died, um, basically dropped in his tracks. So it's performed really well on the animals I've used it on, especially with that copper mono bullet. However, as we were talking about earlier, um, you know, I have an elk tag in my pocket for Idaho this year, and I'm planning on lord willing with the draw next year doing the wyoming general rifle tag for elk so um i need to add another rifle to my lineup um because what a problem i know it's so terrible <laughs> man <laughs> so uh you know i have a 30-06 howa but it weighs like over 10 pounds and i really want like um you know, to invest in something good, but I, you know, I don't have a ton of extra cash. So I'd like to get something that's, um, a good mountain lightweight mountain rifle, but is capable on, uh, you know, elk and even, even up to moose, um, you know, pretty much anything North American. Um, so I, I just want to pick your brain on that. Like what you think I should kind of go with in terms of cartridge, you know, even talk about maybe some different rifles and, and optics and everything. So I don't know, where would you start on that whole, that whole deal? Well, since you mentioned moose, I'm going to say start with a 30 caliber. <laughs> Absolutely. If, yeah. yeah. If you were just talking up to and including elk, I'd say really consider some of the sevens. But a 30 caliber will be probably a better uh, pairing with your 6.5 Creedmoor anyway. Mm-hmm. It's just a substantially bigger step, step up. So, um, and, and I would consider uh, magnums. Absolutely. Mm-hmm. Because they enable you to drive those heavy for caliber bullets that, you know, that perform so well on big game uh, fast enough to be useful. And, um, you know, you get much higher BCs out of those heavier, long, sleek, aerodynamic bullets. So mm-hmm. really the three I would probably, you know, tack up on your, your cork board mm-hmm. on your wall to stare at and dream about would be, the 300 Winchester Magnum, the 300 PRC, and the 300 WSM, Winchester Short Magnum. I was going to ask about the Short Mag. Yep. Now, if you were a real classic gun guy, uh, I would also include a 300 h and H, but that's only if you're serious about hand loading and you just love having something different and unique and very, um, you know, that's something that has that vintage panache. Yeah. It's my favorite thirty caliber cartridge, but it's not for practical reasons. Yeah. So uh, yeah, and more those practical. Three. That's that's one of the reasons I went with the Creedmoor. Also, it was the only kind of offering actually that Weatherby had that was um, under normal circumstances a very available 
fairly cheap rent. Right. Um, and yep. that's something that's that is you know I think is an important thing to think about. Like you know, you just don't want to get stuck with not being able to find your ammo, or you know, even if you get somewhere and something happens to your ammo, you need to just grab a box at a store or something. I mean. Yeah, so. and that's happened to me. I was yeah. in Namibia several years ago with a, a beautiful custom 300 Win Mag, and my ammo, well, my whole luggage didn't show up for two or three days, but the outfitter had a couple boxes of 300 Win Mag ammo mm-hmm. in hand, and I shot two animals with it, you know. There so, you go. Yeah, that's a real thing, and it's for a very sure. practical consideration to have a cartridge that, um, you know, that you can find in every little hardware store across uh, America. Mm-hmm. Now, that really only applies to the 300 Win Mag and only in usual conditions right now. Right. In our climate, <laughs> you know, we, we have a drought Nothing. of rain yeah. here in the West. We also have an ammunition drought across yeah. the nation, For sure. which has been a real challenge. But in normal times, I would add, um, you know, the 300 WSM. And certainly the 300 PRC is the the up-and-coming champion of the future. It's along with the 6.5 PRC, is definitely the fastest-growing cartridge I've seen in a lifetime of watching cartridges. Mm-hmm. And it's got some um, design characteristics that simply make it better than the yeah. other two. Yeah. The one characteristic, aside from just practical availability, the 300 Win Mag that I really like better than the other two is it feeds easily. Got a little more taper in the body. And Mm -hmm. funny enough, that belt, even though, you know, a lot of people deplore the belt on belted magnums and call Mm -hmm. them outdated and all kinds of things. Well, belted cartridges feed much more smoothly, more reliably than any of the new fat stuff, Hmm. including the the 300 PRC. It will feed great in a rifle that's properly designed for it. Right. But uh, it's, it's a little finickier and the 300 wsm is downright finicky just like all of the short magnums so the 300 win mag is a very smooth feeding uh cartridge and if you get a good rifle with a match spec chamber in it Mm -hmm. it'll shoot wonderfully as well if you're ordering something custom by chance have it built with a faster than normal twist rate in the barrel like a one in nine or even a one eight and a half Mm. which will enable you to shoot the um the really high BC long heavy bullets, if you choose to do so, you mm-hmm. don't need to. A one in the classic one in ten will shoot most of the practical hunting bullets you'll be using. Cool. So, you know, advantages of the the three hundred PRC is that it's properly balanced and built for those long high BC bullets. It's the single best extreme range hunting cartridge on the market. If that's your thing, me. My creed has always been to get as close, to be as good a hunter as I can, so I can get as close as possible, but at the same time, be as good a rifleman as possible so that if I have to, I can pull off a very long shot with competence. And the 300 PRC is a really good choice for that. At at this point in my career, you know, I'm hoping to change this, but right now I'm probably not shooting an animal past 400 yards. Just to be honest, I mean, I'd like to, you know, walk that out, but right now that's about where I'm at. So, fair enough. 400 yards is a pretty good um, practical limit. I think, mm-hmm. you know, just you being you, you probably once you get this rifle, have it set up well, you probably extend that competently uh, more quickly than you anticipate. Hmm. Of course, you just have to test yourself. You have to find a place where you can shoot five and six and shoot it you know, vital size targets, elk vital size usually, and shoot in different wind conditions. And pretty quick, you'll realize, hmm, when there's no wind, I am one deadly son of a gun. <laughs> but when there's a lot of wind, I'm, I'm pulling it back to 250. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> for sure, man. So, um, so, it, so kind of, kind of what I'm hearing you say is, 300 PRC performs really well. Winchester short mag also, but if you, if ammo availability is something that you're factoring in there in a normal environment, might want to take a closest look at the 300 Win mag. Yeah, I think that's pretty good and, synopsis. Yes. You know, like I said, I am kind of a Weatherby guy. I'm not 100 percent sure what this next rifle would be. I would like it to be a Weatherby, but I don't know yet. 
Um, so I got to ask, you know, your thoughts on the 300 Weatherby mag, because I no, think their new I, backcountry 2.0, um, I don't think you can get it in, um, when 300 wind mag, I think the only 30 caliber, I think they offer is a 300 Weatherby. Weatherby. That could be correct. So the 300 Weatherby Magnum, I love that cartridge and it used to be my favorite elk cartridge. Uh, and the reason I say used to be is eventually the 300 PRC came along and I, I, I have a, a 300 H and H pre 64 rifle that I just totally fell in love with. And well, that's another story, but <laughs> the 300 Weatherby has one disadvantage and that's like all of the classic traditional Weatherby cartridges. It's built with a lot of free bore. So, you know, you've got up to two tenths of an inch of jump from where your bullet starts before it engages the rifling. It's so one way that Weatherby historically was able to achieve the very high velocities without excess pressure that they're known for. And back in the day, they offered a one and a half inch guarantee at 100 yards, which back then was pretty significant. Now that sounds bad because so yeah. many companies offer a one inch guarantee at 100 yards. Well, that sort of chamber still has the advantage of keeping pressures low, but it's harder to tune for extreme accuracy. So, you know, I eventually came to the point where there are other cartridges I prefer. If you get a 300 Weatherby, you probably still get great performance out of it, but ammunition's going to cost a lot. Brass mm -hmm. will cost a lot, whether you're using brass, you know, once fired brass from loaded factory ammo you buy or, or you just buy it uh, new so less practical in my opinion but mm -hmm. still a great cartridge yeah so all right let's say i do end up going with a 300 win mag and that's you know that's um kind of a time tested cartridge and probably something that a fair amount of my listeners might even already have one um i have not myself gotten into the hand loading game so my my hunting partner he's uh really experienced he's ex-navy special warfare kind of a gun nut so he he and me developed our alaska that 6.5 creed more load together um meaning i was shooting it he was loading them for me um <laughs> man that's so, the best way to do it right <laughs> yeah <laughs> i mean i you know i contributed some uh, components but uh, he was doing the hard work so um, but anyway, um, so, but for guys maybe who aren't, you know, there yet with the hand loading like me, um, if you had to, you know, recommend some, some top tier, you know, factory loads, what would you be kind of looking at there? For the 300 wind mag specifically. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, there are quite a few and let's talk as if you could find them. Yeah, because exactly. on, on today's scene, it may be whatever you can find, right? right. If you're yeah. stuck with factory ammo. The first one, assuming factory ammo is available, would be that I'd look at would be Federal's Terminal Ascent with a uh, 200 grain Terminal Ascent bullet. That's an extraordinary projectile. It's built, the, the rear half of it more or less is, is a solid material. It's a, an alloy, but you can consider it solid copper. So it cannot fragment into nothing the front mm. half has a lead core bonded in so it can't separate it's got a um, excellent engineering in the way that the the walls of the jacket up front taper so that it creates a beautiful mushroom shape got a composite tip up front that um i don't know how deep in the weeds we want to get here with uh, yeah. uh you know ballistic nerdity but uh we can nerd out a little <laughs> okay that's your so specialty so <laughs> i suppose it is uh <laughs> several years ago hornady began using doppler radar to mm. chart bullet flight and develop better bcs and and on top of that an actual drag coefficient for its uh, top tier bullets and mm. it led to a discovery that a lot of other manufacturers have kind of shrugged off because it's inconvenient but i've seen enough uh personal proof uh to think it's a thing it's only a thing in certain conditions but what can happen if you shoot a high bc bullet at high velocity so you've got a very uh, streamlined bullet that holds its velocity well, and you're mm -hmm. starting it fast. The traditional polymer, Delrin polymer used for bullet tips, uh, erodes 
at a certain point. Hmm. Uh, so at a certain point, enough heat is generated that the material becomes a bit soft. Hmm. And it either, well, it does one of or both of two things. It can simply deform mm -hmm. from, you know, the, this friction and the buffeting that flying through the air at Mach several whatever <laughs> applies, yeah. or it erodes particles come off and I think really it's kind of a combination of both and the, the the tricky thing is it doesn't occur consistently from shot to shot it's all over so place. yeah uh, your BCs then they change slightly in mid-flight and mm. again this is only uh, something that occurs with high BC bullets fired at high muzzle velocities let's say you know close to 3,000 feet per second and with a BC of 0. 0.550 or higher. You know, if you're shooting your 308 with a a bullet with a BC of you know 450 or something common for those match bullets, and it's going 2600 feet per second, not a thing. Just doesn't occur. Mm. But in certain cases, it did. So Hornady decided, all right, well, this is a thing we got to find a solution. So they found a material that uh, has a much higher melting point, mm. and so it it just doesn't. Um, have the susceptibility to deforming under those conditions. It's called the heat shield tip, and it's on Hornady's ELDX bullet, the ELD match bullet, and now the new CX bullet, which is their updated version of the, uh, the GMX bullet. Interesting. As it happens, uh, the, the terminal ascent bullet by Federal, circling back to that load, mm -hmm. has a proprietary composite in its tip that is also uh, resistant to heat and erosion. Mm. Just kind of a beautiful um, serendipitous happenstance. It's Thank also a know. hollow tip, yeah. So on impact, it kind of caves in and drives back into the nose of that bullet. And um, I'm careful who I admit this to, but we're talking ballistics and ballistic testing and, and journalistic integrity here. I tested that bullet, the 200 grain, Terminal ascent out of 300 Winchester Magnum ammunition in a prototype form in Africa. I shot Oryx bulls with it from 15 yards to 997 yards. Wow. And in every single case, the bullet performed perfectly. It mushroomed uh, up to double original diameter up front and maintained at least 85 to 90% of its weight. There isn't another bullet on the market that will do that. And the other great thing about the Terminal Ascent is it has a pretty high BC for what it is. Hmm. Uh, if you go with a true monometal bullet like the hammers you're using or some of the Barnes bullets that I use a lot and love or Hornady's CX, because of the, the lesser density of the projectile, you simply cannot achieve the same BCs out of a given weight of bullet because they're they're bigger. There's more friction, you know, more surface area to to have friction gotcha. with the air. So the and reason they're to... keeping that um, that lead corp front is to give them higher density, so a heavier bullet with, but still smaller and uh, more compromised and a more traditional mushrooming action up front. So it kills like a soft nose lead core bullet. Mm. And yet it holds together like a monometal bullet. It's the best of both worlds. So anyway, uh, moving on, that would be my first one that I'd test through that rifle. That okay. bullet is accurate. It's held to a six-tenths of an inch uh, accuracy standard for, I believe, 10-shot groups at 100 yards. Hmm. So it's it's accurate. It's not a burger, you know, or a Hornady match bullet or whatever, but it'll shoot. It's a little finickier than some, so sometimes you have to work for it just a little bit more. If you're a suppressor guy... I don't know if this is just pure coincidence that it's happened to me, but I found those bullets, the terminal ascents, almost always shoot wonderfully with a suppressor. Just interesting side note there. Another one yeah. I'd look at real hard would be uh, Hornady's Outfitter Load with a 190 grain CX bullet. Uh, that's got sealed uh, case mouth and primer, so if you're hunting Alaska, coastal country or something, you get real wet, your loads are going to be fine. Nice. Deep driving bullet with a reasonably high BC, you're probably good to, well, further than most of us should be shooting, easily 700 yards with that. Uh, Nosler 
has some great factory ammunition. I would look to the 200 grain Nosler AccuBond because it's got a reasonably good BC and they're inherently quite accurate. Uh, I have struggled myself to get as good accuracy out of the AccuBond long range bullets. Hmm. And I think there are some, you know, some design characteristics there that optimize aerodynamics, but make them a little finickier. So yeah. I, I like the standard version better myself. So that's three. Um, Federal makes some other good loads too, loaded with a Barnes triple shocks, not an aerodynamic bullet, but inside your 400 yard range. Very effective on elk and moose and whatnot. Uh, so that's a that's a good start. Yeah, definitely. I would try those three factory loads to begin with. Okay. Um, that's good stuff. Um, side note, back to the need more. Do um, you think that that's enough gun? Like, let's say if I was able to do a doll sheep hunt or even mountain goat, would you be comfortable with, 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 that, with, that, uh, with that setup? You or bet. You, yeah, okay. Yeah, I would choose my bullet carefully. And uh, make sure that you're getting legitimate, uh, you know, potential, full potential out of that cartridge. Mm-hmm. I see a lot of guys shooting 18 or even 16 inch barrels on a 6.5 Creed more. And that's, I think that's taking it too short. That cartridge is already on the bottom end of what's really effective uh, for backcountry hunting. And by really effective, I mean something that's got the reach and the authority you need to help you make the most of any opportunity legitimate opportunity that you uh, find in the back country yeah. as a western hunter you know 400 yards is pretty common yeah. i've shot a lot of game between four and 500 yards mm-hmm. so that would be a personal challenge to you is, is yeah start with your 400 yard imposed limit but work to increase that because i think you'll up your potential shot opportunities between 20 and 40 percent which is pretty significant that's very significant and that's definitely the, kind of one of my off-season homework assignments for myself. Yeah, excellent. Now, it's worth noting, though, that the 6.5 Creedmoor, it creates a lot of false confidence in, in some of the guys that use it because it's so accurate and it's so easy to shoot well. And if you can ring a 10-inch steel plate at 600 yards, why wouldn't you shoot an elk at 600 yards, right? <laughs> yeah. Well, you count in excitement. You know, you're surfing on waves of adrenaline mm-hmm. and high altitude and... Uh, an angled shot and potentially some different vectors, wind vectors, you're probably not going to hit the center 10 inches of that elk's vitals. You're going to hit him somewhere around the edges if you're lucky. Yeah. And then, you know, this is the case where the 6.5 Creedmoor gets people in trouble because they take shots they shouldn't. And at those distances, unless you place that bullet surgically, you just don't have much authority. You're yeah. going to end up with a rodeo on your hands and, Sure. So I like the 6.5 Creed more to 400 yards or so on uh, most game. And if you want to shoot elk with it, it sounds like you've got a pretty decent bullet for that in a mono metal. I like a very tough, deep penetrating bullet for use on elk, especially with the smaller cartridges. But yeah, for for sheep or uh, mountain goats, I think you'd be fine. Yeah. Cool. Yeah, man, I'm like you though. Like, uh, you know, if I'm going to be going on a tough elk hunt or something like that, I want to, as you like to say, wallop them. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> I, like, I want to have a little bit of room for error in there and, you know, knock them down if I can. Yeah, and to me, it's a... I honestly can't understand why so many hunters don't have that approach. I mean, if you're putting in... Whether it's a guided hunt for... You know, a good elk hunt's expensive now. Yeah. Guided hunt, or you're just taking... 10 days, including drive time and whatnot, to drive out to the West from someplace mm-hmm. like where you live. And you're taking all that time away from home and family and, and work. Why would you, can't, you know, stake your moment of truth on a tool that's um, moderately capable? You yeah. know, I'm not trying to insult the 6.5 Creedmoor here. I've seen quite a few elk die by it. It's not my favorite tool for the task. You, know, yeah. you can drive a 18 penny nail with a little finish hammer, <laughs> but there are better tools for the task, right? Absolutely. Yeah. And and when we talk about elk, can I go off on a tangent here for a minute? Please do. Okay, elk are a much different beast than deer. Yeah. 
Yeah. White-tailed deer and mule deer, on their very, you know, just between those two are quite different. A white-tail turns inside out and goes into overdrive with, you know, nitrous oxide as soon as they're shot, getting out of there. Yeah. Mule deer tend to kind of stumble around and go, ugh, and then fall <laughs> over, right? Either way, let's call a big buck 200 to 250 pounds. I know there are a few that are bigger, but it's not common. Right. Their bones max out at a certain size. Well, a, a bull elk, a mature bull elk, is a much different animal than a cow or a spike. I hear a lot of people talking about shooting elk with a 6.5 cream when you ask what they shot. It's, oh, it's a cow or it's a young bull. Yeah. Those are 350 to 400, 450 pounds. A big bull will be 700 pounds plus, and I have helped take apart three bulls that were bigger than horses that I'd weighed at 1,000 pounds. Okay. Jeez. Again, they're anomalies. Just like you can get a 300 pound whitetail in Saskatchewan, you can get yeah. a thousand pound elk. That's crazy. And they have a toughness, an ingrained toughness in them that's unbelievable. Their mm-hmm. bones are bigger and uh, denser in some cases, just because they're bigger than any deer. So let's just say the average big bull is easy numbers, 800 pounds. The average big buck is. 200 pounds, you're four times bigger. Why would you think a deer cartridge is going to be ideal? Right. It's not smart. Now, you can't go four times bigger with your cartridge. You'd be packing a 458 lot elephant gun, right? (laughs) But you can go bigger effectively. And you can shoot something like a a 7mm Magnum or a 30 caliber, anything from a 30 out 6 up with a heavy bullet deep penetrating design and it will definitely help you make the most of your opportunity. And the other thing I I preach so much on my podcast is everybody thinks about the long shots, the big cross canyon shots on mm-hmm. elk, you know, bulls climbing the far ridge, bugling their heads off, you know, pushing cows ahead of them, the sun sets behind them and you know there's frost everywhere and yeah. Yeah, it's a gorgeous thing but many of the bulls I've shot, particularly the big bulls, have been inside 100 yards in thick timber. Mm. And you do not get a perfect broadside presentation. Right. So I am unwilling to hunt with a bullet that handicaps my capability under any shot presentation. For sure. I want something that will drive deep at an angle. If that's a quartering two angle, we're talking about driving through a big shoulder bone, size of your wrist, and then through, let's call it 8 to 10 inches of dense shoulder muscle, then through a couple of ribs at an oblique angle mm-hmm. into the vitals, and then you still need to go 20 inches or more to, to get both lungs. That's a lot. Yeah. You take a bullet that you punch into the you know a broadside whitetail, and you just hit maybe hide a rib and then straight through into the lungs, and it stops against the offside. I like to say lungs are just strong bubbles. Yeah. They're full of air. It's right. tissue. It's resilient tissue, but it's still pretty soft. You ever yeah. cut one apart with your knife? It's like it's yeah. cutting whipped cream. You know, yeah. it's not a challenge to to a bullet. So any bullet that stops in a broadside shot on a whitetail is not an elk bullet. Right. And then of course, you know, if you if you catch one going away from you and you need to tuck it right in front of his hip and try and drive through to the offside shoulder, you're looking at needing thirty plus inches of penetration. Wow. Yeah. Possibly a paunch full of partly digested brows, heavy twigs, compacted grass. That stuff tears a bullet up. And that's mm. before you even get to the thoracic cavity and the vitals. So when you're elk hunting, use a big hammer. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely, man. I was listening to a podcast you did recently about your Alaska gun. You're even going with a 338, which is which is a lot of gun too. So. Yeah, and that's because I want to be able to shoot moose out to yeah. 600 yards with authority, <laughs> and I also want to have something that when I'm you know approaching a kill to get another load of meat, if I have a, a bear bear encounter that yeah. comes at me up close, that I have enough authority to um, convince him. To yeah. stop his uh, his unpleasant behavior, <laughs> for sure, man. Um, real super quick question. Um, I don't want to go off on a rabbit trail here, but I carry a Glock twenty with um, Buffalo bore, like 200, 220 grain ammo for bear sidearm. Are you a revolver guy or Glock Glock guy for bear? 
defense um, gun. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so I have um, three different handguns that I will carry on a case, you know, depending on yeah. the occasion, just what I'm in the mood to carry. The one I've carried the most recently is a Smith & Wesson compact frame. It's a, a 44 Magnum. Okay. Model 69 combat magnum so it's got a shorter barrel five shot capacity it's easy to carry and yet it shoots a 305 grain buffalo bore bullet at 1200 mm. feet per second it's moving yeah it is the, the other one is a kimber 1911 mm-hmm. in 10 millimeter and i shoot it really really well i can put nine shots on target very fast i load that with 220 grain buffalo bore bullets probably the same thing you're yeah. carrying the other one when i'm just kind of filling my you know, Western cowboy heritage and roots I'll carry <laughs> is a, a Ruger. It's a Bisley gripped Ruger, which, which helps with huge recoil chambered in 480 Ruger. Okay. And it's a kind of a shortened version of a, like a 475 line bar. Lots of clobber in that yeah, cartridge. For sure, mm-hmm. man. Yeah. I went with the uh, Glock just because I shoot that platform of gun so much better and it's, 15 bullets instead of five or six so yes and i've got i've got a springfield xd10 that i really yeah. like as well but i just haven't had the chance or maybe the inclination to carry it yet but it's the same yeah. thing your glock is an outstanding choice it's a better choice than my kimber because it's lighter yeah. they're tough like a wheelbarrow i mean you can right. do anything to them and they just you keep just on going you can't and best of all you don't feel bad you know if it yeah. if you scar it up bad in the rocks it's like exactly hey, battle wounds right and there's <laughs> no that. safety on that thing so you just pull it out and just go which is good and bad, you know. You got to be aware <laughs> like of it. that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, I do yeah. too. Within certain limitations, right, yeah. right. Yeah. Um, okay. Like I said, I don't want to go on a huge rabbit trail there, but um, one more gun question, and then I want to move on. Um, so, do you hunt suppressed? Because I, mm. I want. I was going to actually talk to you about this before, but i just went ahead and pulled the trigger like monday and just went i got a banished 30 uh from silence nice. or central i just like yeah i'm just gonna do it because i want to hopefully get it before hunting season so yeah. do you hunt suppressed and why every time i can absolutely mm-hmm. uh only the uncivilized no longer <laughs> shoot with suppressors <laughs> uh suppressor is is an amazing tool for the back country uh in certain cases, I will leave one behind. If I'm expecting extremely um, rigorous terrain, like near technical climbing. Is that just because of weight? Well, yeah. When you're climbing like that, uh, bulk and weight is a problem. But more than anything else is the snaggy uh, characteristics yeah. of it. You just I don't want it catching and brush and potentially pulling me off balance. But uh, for everything else, I use one whenever I can. Some guns aren't set up for them and you just Mm -hmm. can't, but there are so many advantages you and more importantly, the people around you, particularly when you start guiding your kids. Yeah. uh, They don't have to put in herring protection. It's so it's that, it's that like dramatic. You don't even need put ears in. Right. No, I still will. If I'm just doing a range session because there's still that sonic crack. It sounds like kind of a mild 22 cartridge, right? But in a hunting scene, no way. You just go to town. It makes it easy to communicate in whispers with your guide. You know, they're not trying to cover their ears and glass at the same time. Uh, there's so many advantages to it. And oddly enough, about 8 out of 10 rifles that I test, writing them up for various magazines, shoot better with the suppressor than without. Hmm. I think it's something about the harmonic dampening characteristics of hanging a weight on the end of your barrel. Yeah. And probably just... Um you know, less flinching with the recoil reduction, maybe? Sure. They re- reduce recoil depending on cartridge and suppressor in the neighborhood yeah. of 25 to 50%, which, you know, wow. that's maybe not quite as much as a really aggressive break. But if there's one thing I don't want to hunt with, it's an aggressive break. If I hunt with yeah. a break at all, I want it to be a very minimal break just to take the edge off. Yeah. Because I've, I've lost too much hearing as it is. I've got pretty protective of what I've got left. Absolutely, man. Um, uh, man, well, that's, that's really good stuff. I've enjoyed this, uh, talk about guns that kind of flew by, but, um, there is one little topic I, or there is one important topic I do want to like hit on uh, real quick before we're done here, man, is, um, you know, it's kind of a theme of the podcast and I've heard you mention, 
uh, on podcasts before about I think the one that specifically stands out um, when you said uh, if you see a nice buck on Sunday it's a temptation but if you see a giant buck it's it's a blessing from the Lord and you got to go after it <laughs> well you should never deny a blessing <laughs> yeah. so yeah man I'd, I'd love to hear like what um, you know what role your faith plays in your life and and how that's kind of um, shaped your experience of the outdoors or or how your experience of the outdoors has shaped your faith you know that's uh gosh i consider myself a spiritual man but i'm not good at religion i you know i attend church every sunday and i well it's I not you know it's not it. about the rules it's about relationship right yeah and i'm i'm not even as good at talking with god as i should be but i find that when i talk to him he's awfully good at talking back to me <laughs> And in fact, if I, if I may, I'll share an experience I had yeah. uh, here in a minute, but, uh, I only share it with people that I know are receptive to it because it's hard to believe. Anyway, uh, I've always found that, um, you know, while I, when I look for God in my everyday life, whether it's at home, in the middle of an, you know, trying to wrangle a bunch of rowdy kids mm-hmm. or on a drive through a big city and heavy traffic or whatever, I always find him. The trouble is it's it's hard for me to motivate myself sometimes to look because I get, um, I guess, blindsided and just, you know, snowed in with the, the cares of the world. Absolutely. Rely on the arm of flesh, if you will. You know, I'm I'm really bad at that. That's something I need to work on personally. But anytime I go to the mountains... Or I get out into wild country. Um, I it feels like I don't have to search for God. He's just there, mm. and there's an automatic connection. And maybe that's one reason I love it so much. Uh, you that's get cool. out there, and it's just a natural thing. You see the earth, you see the beauty of creation, and um, yeah, there's a an almost a. Um, an unparalleled connection for me. I don't find that anywhere else. For sure. So just a little bit of a, you know, a testimony to the power of prayer, if I can yeah, share man. that with you. I'd love to. A little over a year ago, coming up on a year and a half ago now, I did a, a drop camp DIY caribou hunt in Alaska, and I did it solo. Mm. So I was about 70 miles from the nearest um, habitation got dropped off in a pretty gnarly spot. Even the pilot told me, he said, this is quite candidly a very <laughs> bad spot to land. We're on the top of a ridge. We're above timberline. And um, watch the wind for me because he said, I can only land in a no wind condition or in a, a condition where the wind is coming down the ridge. Mm-hmm. If it's coming across, I can't land. And, of course, if there's fog, I can't land. So... That was a, a challenging experience. I you know I recorded two in the field type episodes, and I think they're in the '90s on the Backcountry Hunting Podcast. Listen to them if you're interested, folks. Yeah. I do talk about some of this, but very challenging experience. Shot a nice bull the second day in, and got him packed out by the end of day three, and overdid it. I was exhausted. I was extremely tired. Got real cold. Borderline hypothermia. Um, I got kind of warmed up, took me over a day to get dried out, warmed up enough. Oh, wow. And then all my electronics went belly up. I had like 13% left on my inReach that I needed to preserve to communicate with the pilot. And yeah. I had four days of nothing ahead. Ooh. I finished my book and it was a bad storm had come in. So it was raining. I had, you know, near gale force winds at night. I was... You know, thinking, all right, well, here I'm above Timberline. What am I going to do if my tent blows up and I get all wet and I I brought a down sleeping bag? I should know better, but I had. So anyway, lots of challenges. But to cut to the chase, what I want to tell you about was, again, I don't share this with too many people, but I think your, your listeners will relate. Yeah. I got a message that the, the pilot was coming in a day early. He was going to come check and see if um, if he could make it down. And the next morning, of course, um, I uh, got up and there's fog everywhere. Mm. Can't land in fog. So I just kept listening. And about 3 in the afternoon, I heard a plane coming. And 
so much fog around. You can't land in fog. And I just, I threw a prayer heavenwards and said, Lord, if if you want me to get out today, bring us up a little wind and blow this fog out. And I mean, I still, I'm getting chills right now thinking about it. I couldn't believe it. It was like something you'd see in a documentary of, you know, the the Old Testament or something. Mm -hmm. But literally, a wind came out and blew a big rift in the clouds. And I was looking from my camp, which was about a three quarters of a mile from the landing strip, down the length of that ridge top that he lands on. Blue sky. It was framed in blue sky. And in the distance, there's a bush plane coming in. Mm. He circled a few times and landed. And I had all my meat up there uh, stacked under a, a you know a little A-frame and a tarp next to the uh, the landing strip. So I started packing my camp up fast as I could. He told me, "Don't break camp till you see me actually get down." Because he said I got to circle a bit, and he said I may not be able to land. So don't yeah. don't take your tent down till you know I'm down. Anyway, 20 minutes later, he took off again, and I kind of knew what he was doing. He had to get, he couldn't take everything out in one load, so he was taking the caribou out, all the meat and the, the mm. antlers out in one trip. And I figured he'd be about an hour, which he was, and of course, the fog came back. Oof. And, you know, without getting too worried about it, same thing happened. I threw another prayer up. He circled a couple times, and a rift came through the fog, just blew wide open, and he came in and landed. Yeah. And, you know, I've always known prayer works, but that was the strongest, um, you know, I yeah. guess uh, I was just a, such a testimony yeah, to man. me to see that, to experience that. And, yeah, you can you can attribute that to whatever you want, but I saw it happen, and I can't deny that, so... Yeah, that's amazing, man. Yeah, he's a he's a good father, and he wants he wants to give us good stuff, and um, that's really cool, man. When he looks out for you like that, and I bet you were happy to get out there in like a day early too, because that sounds kind of scary. Yeah, it was it wasn't scary so much. I mean, I'm pretty comfortable in my own skin out there. Uh, you know, I'd seen five grizzlies the first night around camp and whatnot. There was plenty to be worried about, but. It was more just the the monotony. Yeah, uh, I'm a pretty active guy, and yeah. my brain likes to be occupied. For and sure. So during that time, once I kind of got warmed up and you know fed myself a bit, I was just finding projects. I um, I hiked all the way down to the valley floor and brought up some poles to make an A-frame to hang my meat under, and cool. spent a lot of time just collecting pebbles and sharp rocks out of the little landing strip, trying to make it better and just trying to stay occupied. But yeah. when it doesn't get dark till you know ten or eleven, and then it's light at four thirty in the morning, it's those are long days for sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. especially alone. Um, and with thirteen percent left on your in reach battery. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, but yeah, man, that's really cool. Um, I'm, I love hearing that stuff. And yeah, just a word of encouragement for you. It's something I say a lot. As you know, you're saying you know you're not maybe you're not as good about finding time to pray or whatever. But um, you know, don't don't feel guilty about it. But it's just like um, just like you know, discipline with your physical fitness or anything else. Um, and, and setting like a meeting with a person, like we had to agree on a time and a place and just set it up and make it happen. So that's what I do. I just kind of say, okay, the first 15 minutes, 30 minutes, whatever. And I wake up, wake up a little early. Just, that's my meeting time with God, you know, and just kind of, if you don't set the time and the place and just kind of force yourself to do it sometimes, sometimes it feels awesome and you love it. Sometimes it's just like, oh man, but you just kind of get through it. Just like going to the gym or whatever it is, you know, but, um, sure. but yeah, so anyway, um, yeah, man, I've really appreciated uh, your time and really enjoyed talking to you. Um, learned a lot on the rifle side of things, and that was a really cool story about that that we ended there with. So um, just uh, real real quick, just tell folks where they can uh, find more of your stuff if they want to hear more from you. Sure. Well, and, and thanks for the encouragement, my friend. I Yeah, buddy. I should do that. I need that. I need sometimes a little bit of brotherly support. So Yeah, man. And I appreciate what you do with, uh, you know, Un- unabashedly bringing God into the, the hunting scene in the back country. So for sure. Yeah. Man. As far as finding me, I'm on Instagram. I, you know, I dread it. Social media is not my favorite thing to do, <laughs> but I do have 
a personal account. That's Joseph Von Benedict. Um, and then, uh, you know, a little more family stuff on that and, and pure gun related work stuff. And then I have the backcountry hunting podcast, Instagram page to all one word and Facebook. I got a website, but, um, really the best place is just on the podcast, which mm-hmm. is the backcountry hunting podcast found wherever podcasts are found. Love to have you follow along. Yeah, man. Yeah. I definitely recommend guys check it out. It's a lot of good stuff on there and um, are you going to be at the uh, Western Hunt Expo by chance? I will. Nice. I'll meet you out there then. Sounds good. Yeah. Ping me cool. with a message and we'll make a point of getting together. I'd like to Yeah, when we stop hand. recording or something, maybe I can grab your number just so I can link up with you out there. Sure. Um, all right, man. Well, thanks again for your time. I appreciate you and uh, looking forward to meeting you in a week or so here. Yeah, likewise. It's been an honor to join you here. Thanks, my friend.